On this webinar today, we are going to address frequently asked questions about the COVID-19 vaccines. Our speakers today are HSS experts, Dr. Andy Miller and Alexandra Grisas. Dr. Miller is a physician in infectious diseases and internal medicine, and Alexandra Grisas is the Assistant Vice President of Infection Prevention with training as an infectious disease epidemiologist and an infection preventionist. Both Alex and Dr. Miller have played critical roles in keeping HSS staff and patients safe during this pandemic and in the planning of the HSS Community Vaccination Program. And I will hand it off to Alex and Dr. Miller now and we can get started. Thanks, Bonnie. Well, good evening everyone from New York City and thank you so much for joining us tonight. I am so pleased to be here with my friend and colleague, Dr. Andy Miller. You know, this, this past year has been really challenging for all of us and we are not out of the woods yet. But the release of the COVID-19 vaccine in December has shined some much needed light on our path back to normal. So Andy, how about we jump right in and let's talk about the two COVID vaccines currently available and how they work. Sure, thank you, Alex. <clears throat> and thank you to all the viewers here tonight. It's really exciting to join you today for this discussion. Um, there are basically two COVID vaccines that are currently available for use in the United States and they're very, very similar to each other. One's made by Pfizer and the other one is made by Moderna. Both vaccines are given as a shot, usually into the upper arm or shoulder muscle and the injection itself is just like a flu shot. The exciting thing about these new vaccines is that they seem to work really well in decreasing your chance of getting sick with COVID. They work the same way as each other. Both vaccines are made of messenger RNA or mRNA, which is coated in an oily layer to keep it stable. And that's a little bit like an M&M &M, uh, as a chocolate that's coated in candy. I love that description, a candy coated vaccine. <laughs> Um, so mRNA is most easily described as instructions for your body's cells. mRNA molecules are how your cells bring information from DNA inside the nucleus outside into the rest of the cell, which is where proteins are made. In this case, with this vaccine, the mRNA contains instructions on how to make a piece of the spike protein, and the mRNA never gets inside the nucleus. Uh, the spike protein that gets made is only one small piece of the coronavirus virus. It itself isn't a virus. It can't replicate. It's harmless. It's just a molecule. On its own, and this is the most important thing for people who might not be sure about this, the spike protein cannot and does not cause COVID-19 infection, just like a flu shot does not cause influenza. I think, I think that's a really important point to pause on because that question comes up all the time. It's probably one of the most common questions about vaccines. So to reemphasize, the COVID vaccine, just like the flu vaccine, cannot give you COVID. But Andy, tell us a little bit more about how our bodies do develop immunity once you get these vaccines. So when you get vaccinated, cells in your muscle that take up the injected mRNA, use it to make spike protein, as I said, and the immune system noticing the spike protein reacts to it. It's that immune response, the immune response getting exposed to and reacting to the spike protein that builds immunity to the COVID-19 virus. It keeps you from getting infected. Your body makes antibodies, B cells and T cells develop and you become immune to uh, the virus when you are exposed to it. What we know for sure is that both vaccines work extremely well at preventing people from getting sick with COVID-19. Um, and if you get infected with COVID-19, obviously you can have serious life-threatening complications or even die. And we know that older people or people with more health conditions are more likely to get very sick, but certainly the pandemic has killed many people with good health uh, from all walks of life. The other part is that if you get inf infected with COVID-19, you might not get symptoms at all, but you can still be infectious, which means you can spread the disease to your friends and family and they can get sick. What we think is that these vaccines dramatically lower the risk of that spread too although we still don't know by exactly how much. But those two reasons are really why I and, and scientists and doctors around the country think it's really important for everyone to go get vaccinated when your turn comes. I think you make a good point, Andy. I mean, we saw it for the past year. It doesn't matter who you are or where you come from, you can get sick with COVID and, and you can die, which is why I'm so excited we have an option now to get vaccinated. So when you do go and get your vaccine, I'm sure you're wondering what you can expect. Well, first off, COVID vaccines are being offered free in the United States, which is a huge, huge pro in giving access to more people. Both Pfizer and Moderna vaccines currently require two identical doses of each vaccine to be fully effective. 
So you'll either get two Pfizer or two Moderna. Currently, there's really no mixing and matching except for in extraordinary circumstances. So expect to get two of the same as of now. The Pfizer vaccines are given 21 days apart, so three weeks, and Moderna is given 28 days apart or four weeks. And actually, when you go to get your first dose, most vaccine centers are going to set you up for your second dose appointment right then and there so you get the timing right, because that's important. You know, over the past couple of months that we've been setting up our vaccine distribution center here at HSS, we've learned a lot about it, and it truly is an art form. It takes so much planning to coordinate the number of patients, the number of doses down to the exact number you plan to give in a day. So I'll just say this, on behalf of everyone who's getting and getting, getting and giving vaccine, excuse me, please do your best to try to keep your appointment once you have one made, because a wasted dose could be a huge risk to vaccine distribution success across this country. And also try to make appointments at one place only. That way appointments are available to everyone who's eligible. So you get your second shot, then what happens? Well, it takes about one to two weeks after you've gotten your second dose for the vaccines to become fully effective. Data is showing us from the trials that the Pfizer vaccine is about 95% effective at preventing COVID illness and Moderna is logging in at 94.1%. It's really, really exciting to see these numbers. But to be transparent, please understand that these efficacies were coming from really highly controlled study settings. So as more people get vaccinated around the world, as we learn more about these vaccines, we will also continue to learn about how well they actually work. But I still think the data is really promising. Yeah, that's absolutely right. That's, that's great. You know, right now, the main limitations to getting vaccinated, the way I see it, are that we don't have enough supply, um, that the supply isn't necessarily being distributed, um, and that there aren't that many vaccine centers where you can go, particularly in rural areas, to get vaccinated. As many of you know, in our country, we're not reaching our vaccination goals, but I'm hoping that in the next few months, we'll be seeing millions of doses released and distributed around the country. And hopefully there'll be more places to go to get your vaccines, including community pharmacies and mobile units, in addition to hospitals and community centers. Um, if you're thinking of if you should get the vaccine, there are really two clear medical reasons why you're not eligible to get vaccinated. First is people who have been who have had serious uh, allergies to the components of the COVID-19 vaccine, they should definitely not go and get the, this, uh, these vaccines. And some of the compounds that go into them are polyethylene glycol and some polysorbates. And so if there's a question about allergy, you need to talk to your doctor and not go ahead and get it if there's a high suspicion that you'll be allergic. The other group that shouldn't get uh, the vaccine are people who are too young. So for the Pfizer group, if you're below 16 years old, and for Moderna, if you're uh, below 18, years old, you can't get the vaccine. Hopefully in the next few months, we'll be learning more about the safety and efficacy in children. Now, there are lots of people with health concerns who are asking, and I get many of these questions every day uh, about whether or not they should get vaccinated. And the CDC says that there are some people with, where, for whom special considerations should be made. So if you had COVID in the last three months or you received COVID-19 antibodies like Regeneron in the last three months, you need to talk to your doctor and really consider putting that vaccination off for that 90 day period. Um, a lot of discussion, uh, maybe we'll get to this more in the question and answer session has gone to, to women who are of childbearing age. So people planning to get pregnant or uh, who are pregnant or who are breastfeeding. Uh, right now, many of the medical societies in the United States and most doctors think the benefits of vaccination in these women still outweigh the risks. But um, we advise that you talk to your doctor and, and, and talk about what's known and not known about it. But on the balance, I do believe that these uh, women should be getting vaccinated. If you have a serious bleeding disorder or a serious immunocompromise, still important to get vaccinated, but also important to talk it over with your doctor beforehand to check in and see what's new and what's been learned. So over time, we're gonna learn more about any particular patient groups that have particular benefits or risks from the vaccine. There's so much left to learn. But so far, the vaccine seems extremely safe and extremely effective. So in general, we're saying, yes, go and get your vaccine. If anybody here is an HSS patient who's planning to come for elective surgery soon, we want our patients to have had a vaccine seven days away from any surgery, either before or after your surgery here at HSS, please. If you have any specific questions in that regard, just call the surgical office and we'll, we'll figure it out. I want to highlight your point, Andy, about getting the vaccine if you've had COVID in the last 90 days. 
So if you fall into that group, definitely talk to your doctor about both the vaccine and timing. You know, definitely people in the trials had COVID, but we still want to make sure that we're using the vaccines most effectively and using them in the right group. So talk to your physician. Ultimately, though, it's still recommended that you get the vaccine. You know, what we've been seeing is that immunity from natural COVID infections, the effects differ very widely in different people. So you may not be as immune as the next person who had COVID. So ultimately, we want you to get your vaccine. Plus, to Andy's point earlier tonight, getting infected with COVID is dangerous, both to you and for those around you. So speaking of safety, I want to acknowledge that, you know, the COVID vaccines are still very new. We've said this a few times already tonight, and we do not know everything about them. So while a broad range of people took the vaccines in the trials, there may be special groups that have special risks, like Andy was saying, and we are continuing to learn. You know, the news, the science, it's coming out daily and constantly. I can't tell you how many times we actually edited the content and made sure we were as up to date as of an hour ago. So just please be patient and be aware that if you do have any special concerns, just reach out to your provider. The other thing I do wanna say is be reassured that over 71 million people have received the vaccine as of this morning and over 24 million here in the US. So these vaccines do appear to be very safe. You know, speaking of getting the vaccine, Andy, do you mind telling us a little bit about your experience that you had getting the vaccine and, you know, what side effects people might expect? Because it's not nothing. No, it's not nothing. And that's, that's for sure. Um, I had my first dose of the Pfizer vaccine uh, right before Christmas time. And I got my second shot uh, three weeks later, exactly. Um, the injection itself was no big deal. Um, feels like a flu shot. And um, the next day I had a particularly sore arm and I had a mild headache. And that was about it. My kids told me I was cranky that <laughs> evening. Uh, but other than that, I was fine. And then um, I was a little worried about my second dose uh, because they, on average, people have somewhat worse reactions after the second dose. But I actually had less of a reaction after the second dose. It was the same, but a little bit less. So not everybody uh, follows that path. So, and you know, I, I'd say you should expect that you'll probably get symptoms like that if you get this vaccine. In more than half the people who get the vaccine, they have pain at the arm, they feel tired, more than half of them can put, report something like a headache. Um, about one in five people actually have a fever. Some people have chills without fever. That's common. What also is pretty common is actually that the arm gets swollen. Again, 20% or less, but it happens. Or it can stay red, or it can get red a few days later, particularly after the second dose. And then there's more nausea and vomiting, particularly with the Pfizer dose. And I, looking at the numbers, I was surprised. We haven't seen that as much at HSS, but it's been reported. Sometimes, um, since you're giving the vaccination in the arm, a local lymph node in the armpit can swell. And that can be distressing, but that's just your body reacting to the virus. And then I've been telling my patients that when they get these side effects, it's actually sort of a sign that the, that, that the immune system is working. But that certainly doesn't mean that if you don't have side effects, that the vaccine didn't work. Now about- Andy, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I think that's a really important point. I actually got asked this question last weekend. Someone called me on Saturday night and said, it's been two days and nothing's happening. Does that mean it's not working? So the answer is no, that's not what it means. Absolutely right. That's absolutely true. There's no sign that the strength of your reaction has anything to do with the, uh, with the protection you get from the vaccine. We'll learn. Maybe it'll turn out farther down the road that it has something like that. But so there was no sign of that in the studies. About, it's important to say that uh, you know, people have been very worried about anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is an, a you know, life-threatening immediate allergy after the vaccine. Important to remember that you'll be watched for a few minutes, 15 minutes typically. 30 minutes if there's a reason for particular concern after each dose of vaccine. And anaphylaxis is only happening in one in about 111,000 Americans who are getting this vaccine. Super, super rare. So it happens, um, but uh, it's, it's uh, unlikely. And it's, when it happens, it happens generally in people who have an al a history of severe allergies. Now, there have been news reports about deaths. There was uh, suspicion that old people in Denmark were dying, uh, Nor Norway rather, uh, and uh, in a couple of uh, cases in the United States had died as a result from the vaccine. Now, if we've given so many million uh, vaccines so far, it's really not sure that we can establish a causal relationship. 
And what's clear is that death rate is really low compared to a lot of other things we do. But this is obviously something that's gonna be watched. There may be uh, serious rare deaths uh, as a result of the vaccine, but it's preventing so many more deaths from COVID. When, whenever a new product comes out, we learn more about it in the months afterwards. So idiosyncratic reactions. And we'll be learning more about that over time. I have no doubt we'll learn some rare things, but I'll say it again. In general, this is, uh, seems to be a safe vaccine. And remember the side effects, when you get them, take your Motrin, take your Tylenol, don't take them before the vaccine, don't take them to prevent your symptoms, just take them if you're having a sore arm or chills or fever. Uh, and you just go home, you take the Tylenol when, when you're feeling sick and that should do the trick. You know, I feel like I was really on the, the forefront of getting the vaccine. I'm not always uh, so, so up to date. I did drive a 2002 Dodge Neon up until this past September. So, but I am, I am vaccinated. And my experience was pretty similar to yours as well. I got my first dose and about 36 hours later, I just suddenly had headache, chills, a really low grade fever and just kind of felt puny. So I laid on the couch, my, my hubby, thanks Brian, brought me some soup and a couple hours later I was fine. The second time around though, it was a little bit worse um, and the symptoms started sooner, about 12 hours after I got my second dose, had the same exact symptoms and they lasted a little bit longer, about two days. Um, but it was pretty much like a mild cold and then I woke up and I felt perfect and I felt reassured because I had finished the series. So I'm still very, very, very um, optimistic and still think everyone should get the vaccine. Yes. Um, and, you know, to Andy's point, he was talking a lot about some of the side effects. So I wanted to make sure you felt reassured about what happens to monitor vaccine safety. So first off, the CDC has a new system out there called vSafe. That's V as in Victor dash safe. And it's essentially a text based smartphone program that will send surveys to anyone to do personalized health check ins after you get your COVID vaccines. The other thing that's been in place for a very long time is the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System or VAERS. Now that's a national system run by the CDC and the FDA to monitor things related to vaccination. You know, it was something that was used heavily back in 2009 after the H1N1 pandemic and monitoring the H1N1 vaccine and we're using it again for COVID vaccines. So essentially whenever there's a serious adverse event, healthcare providers are mandated to report that and things like allergic reactions, deaths, anything that's unexpected is investigated to see if there is a causal link. And I also really, really appreciated after getting the COVID vaccines, that 15 minute wash period. So everyone will be monitored for 15 minutes afterwards. And of course, if you have any concerns later than that, that's where you can report to vSafe, you can contact your healthcare provider. And of course, if you ever have a medical emergency, which should be extremely rare based on what we're seeing, obviously call 911. But with all this being said, I wanna acknowledge that some of this can sound scary and I, I wanna say it does, we're not downplaying this at all. Um, some of these side effects definitely are unpleasant. So Andy, what have you been saying to your friends and family about getting the vaccine? Um, well, I have to say I'm proud of having steered a lot of my uh, older family members. Hi, Lucia. And, uh, and the parents of some of my friends and many of the eligible HSS employees who had questions about the vaccine to get vaccinated. You know, right now, um, if you look across the country, 55 out of every 55 people who get COVID, someone dies. And about one in 900 Americans who were alive last January, one year ago, are dead now because of the pandemic. It's taken a pretty terrific toll. I don't think everybody realizes it, but everybody knows somebody who got really sick with COVID, I'll bet. So now we have a vaccine that can reduce your chance of getting this infection by as much as 95% and with some mild side effects. So I have to say, I'm incredibly motivated to keep on telling the people I love and my colleagues and my patients, yes, yes, this is worth it. So, um, you know, we've repeated that many times already in this webinar and I don't want to get too repetitive, but this is important and it's the benefits really do outweigh the risks. Unfortunately, most of you have to wait your turn. Well, I, I feel the same way. Um, but I, I appreciate what you're saying. And thank you everyone for being here tonight. You're part of our family too. So that's why we're here to chat with you about the importance of this vaccine. Um, besides that, there's obviously some things to talk about. And one of the things is speed. I get this question all the time. How did this vaccine come to market so fast? Is it safe? Like what happened? Well, first off, we were really, really lucky. One of the reasons that this vaccine has been a scientific success 
is that there was so much engagement early on. There was a ton of public support as well as a lot of private engagement, i.e. money. The other thing that made this vaccine come to market faster is that the actual DNA sequence, the actual viral sequence, happened really early on and it was shared widely. So people have been working on this for well over a year now. So. Yeah. I, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of concerns that also that the vaccine is, uh, that, you know, this is too new. And, it, you know, all of the phases were done. I wanted to, to sort of just to describe for people who don't know, when as new products come out, they're preclinical uh, studies that are done in the lab or in animals. And then you start giving it to a few humans to make sure it's not uh, terribly unsafe and to see what the, the right doses might be. Those are called phase one studies, but just a few dozen patients are in. Then you move on to phase two, and then you move on to the very big phase three study where you're looking at thousands, or in this case, tens of thousands of patients in each vaccine trial uh, that was looking for whether it works and looking for signals that there might be safety problems. So. Yeah. I don't want to cut you off, but I think you said something really interesting last week when we were talking about this. Don't forget everyone, not every vaccine that has started to be developed has come to market. This week alone, we've had one or two, I think, that they've paused. Right, so the Merck, the Merck vaccine, uh, I think was in phase one or two trials, didn't get to phase three. And they said, you know, this is not gonna be worth it. I'm not totally sure why, uh, but they said, this is not worth developing further. And they stopped it. And that's a good thing. It's, a good, it's good to know not only that the in, you know, industry can come up with products that they try to say are good, but that industry can also sometimes say, this is not gonna be good enough. It gives me a little bit of, a little bit of faith. Um, so, and, and then of course there are vaccines, uh, for instance, the Russian vaccine that was released without uh, all of this regulatory uh, study and uh, without a phase three trial and without publications and, and they went ahead to release it. So it, all the studies here were done in, in ways that haven't, uh, that weren't necessarily done in other parts of the, the world. One of the things that made release so fast, uh, that, that's unusual, you know, a lot, I saw a, an analogy of the way we've done this rollout to expedited shipping on your Amazon order. You pay <laughs> a little bit of extra, but you know, it gets you there faster. Um, and and uh, one of the things that happened is as they were doing phase three studies, they were also producing tens of millions of doses of the vaccine with the knowledge that if the phase three trials failed, they would lose that uh, production. But they, in, in, they, they made all of this. So as soon as the phase three trials uh, were, were done and there was an effect, they were able to release the vaccine. And that's one of the reasons why it happened so fast. Phase four trials are what's happening now. We've released it to 70 million people. They've gotten it. And now it's time to collect that data and make sure that it's fairly safe and see how effective it is. You know, a lot of what we're learning is it's incredibly fast moving. And I think so far, at least in terms of these vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, it's fairly transparent. And I have to say, if you, you know, the more online you are, the more you're learning. And I'm, I'm learning a lot from scientists studying this on Twitter and on, you know, uh, rapid communications. Uh, there's a lot going on. So, um, you know, we're gonna, it's gonna be interesting to see how this goes with these vaccines and more vaccines coming down the road. Yeah, totally. And all this data is available online. You do a quick Google search of the FDA papers and you go on the CDC website, which we'll share later with you. And, and you can see the data from the trials. Well, speaking of learning more, I've also been reading a lot about the new strains that have emerged and I'm sure that's on the minds of the audience tonight. There's been new strains that have popped up in the UK, Denmark, South Africa, and we are seeing them here in the US now. Can you tell us a little bit about how that happens and why vaccines change in this way, as well as if the two COVID vaccines we're talking about tonight are effective? Uh, yeah, so this is, um, for anybody who's been reading the news, this is a topic that's been rapidly evolving over the past couple of weeks. And by rapidly evolving, I also mean that there may be some evidence that the virus is evolving. Uh, with signs that there are some mutations and that those mutations might be really important biologically and medically. You know, these mutations happen. Uh, in, that's how, how microbes evolve. That's how we evolve too. And um, as we watch this virus, we see these mutations happen. And some of them might be happening because they help the virus transmit from person to person better or because they allow the virus to survive within a human longer by escaping immunity but sometimes they just sort of happen for no reason, no clear reason at all, it's just chance. So we don't really know that how important these mutations are gonna be, but they sure are concerning. So 
right now, what we know as of uh, January 27th is that the vaccines that are available, Pfizer and Moderna, appear extremely effective against these new strains. And the, the vaccines, if there's gonna be a problem down the road with new, new mutations, are gonna be able to be changed fairly quickly. So let's say you'll get a booster of an updated uh, vaccination down the road if adjustments are needed. Um, right now, no one can say for certain whether or not these things are gonna be very meaningful or a little bit meaningful, but I've, I'm reassured and I, 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 there are some interesting graphs coming out for one of the mutations, uh, the one from South Africa, showing that there is a decrease in the neutralizing titer. That's the immune strength of, of the vaccine uh, with the South African, uh, against the South African mutated virus. But the good part about that is even though that uh, strength comes down, it's still well above whatever level we need to protect against infection, or so we think. I think the most important thing with this mutation uh, news is that it's important to remember that we might not be done with COVID. There may be more coming down the road. There may be twists and turns on this road and we need to continue, unfortunately, and I hate saying it, to wear your mask and to distance yourselves and to stay home and to put off the vacation. All of these things we've been doing for so many months, even though we're really tired. Here, here. I know. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it, it's true. And, you know, public health strategies, they always build on one another. You can't just wash your hands and not wear the mask. So the vaccine is one more tool in our toolbox to move back on our path to normal. And each part is equally important. So thank you everyone for staying vigilant. I really, really, really appreciate you. So now that we've talked a lot about how the vaccines work, we've talked about safety, and we've talked a little bit about what you can expect. I'm sure the question on everyone's mind is, when am I gonna get my vaccine? Well, the answer depends on where you live as well as where you work and what you do for work. Each state has taken guidance that came out in December from the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, also known as ACIP, and those guidelines are available on the COVID um, CDC website right for you online and they develop their own strategies for their state and their state's own needs. So here in New York, for example, we're currently vaccinating healthcare workers that have direct on-campus access, New York residents who are 65 and older, as well as a wide variety of job types. There's a really long list, but things like emergency medical services, childcare workers, in-person educators. As of this morning, Connecticut was vaccinating very similar groups, but they're focused on Connecticut residents 75 and older. And by contrast, New Jersey is vaccinating those groups, but they're also including those 16 to 64 years of age who have medical conditions. So you can see it's a little different everywhere. You know, in a nutshell, as we're learning more, as vaccine distribution is changing, as supplies are evolving, as more comes, as less comes, you'll eventually need to check your local health department, and that'll be your best bet to figure out when you'll be eligible for your vaccine. Contact your healthcare provider, and please sign up as soon as you're eligible. It really helps with that planning I mentioned earlier to know what the demand is going to be and where to distribute the vaccine in the different local markets. So before we open it up to discussions, I just have one more question for you, Andy. To those who might still be hesitant to get the vaccine, even if they already are eligible as of today, January 27th, what would you like to share with them tonight? Um, Go get the vaccine. Well, so, you know, all of us know people who uh, believe that the vaccine is wrong for them. And uh, if you don't know them, these people personally, they're certainly online. And there are um, plenty of people here and, and the people who signed up for this uh, in the audience who believe that the vaccine is right for them. All of those people believe that what they're doing is right and that they're protecting their health and their families by choosing that choice. And you need to be sympathetic to that, uh, whichever side of the, of, of the divide you're on, uh, that they think they're doing the right thing. And so, starting from that place and, and thinking that they are most concerned about keeping themselves safe and healthy is a, a place to start with people who are doubtful. Some think that this vaccine is too new. I think we've talked about that quite a bit. It is new, so is COVID. And this is, these vaccines have really gone through a lot of rigor and testing. Some think that the vaccine will interfere with their DNA. Uh, that's been a concern. It's been well publicized. It does not. Uh, and I, there's a lot of science that goes behind the, that backs that up. It will not interfere with your DNA or get into your chromosomes or your nucleus, et cetera. Others have been worried about fertility. And there was a little bit of 
scientific misinformation uh, that got well publicized as these uh, vaccines got uh, popular. Um, and there is really uh, only this, um, I'd say a misinformed hypothesis about the possibility that it would, uh, that it would affect fertility. And there's really no evidence. And if you look at other um, vaccines, none uh, affect fertility. So, so far the science and our knowledge about vaccines in general sort of support that this is gonna be safe in those regards. And then there's a, a, another argument against getting the vaccine. People don't trust the recommendations of doctors, scientists, drug companies, and the government. And there are really valid reasons for some people to distrust those authorities. I understand some of the reasons for the distrust and there are decades of mistreatment in some communities and patient groups by scientists and doctors and the government. So, for those people, I think we need to recognize that we're in a unique time now where we have an opportunity to use this powerful vaccine against a pathogen that kills people more or less indiscriminately um, when you get sick with it. There are populations that get sicker and there are populations who, who are more protected, but it's, it's a bad pathogen. And we, we can prevent illnesses in ourselves and protect our parents and our children. Uh, we all can. Uh, this vaccine was developed by thousands of people in record time and it was tested in diverse populations and it looks like it works well. So I'd say if you're on this, on this webinar and you're thinking of uh, holding off on getting the vaccine when it comes, uh, com comes your turn, that you think about it carefully and then you choose uh, and to change your mind, which can be very hard to do, but I hope you can do it. Well, and I'll say this, I, I've scanned some of the questions that have come in and there's a lot of good ones, over hundred at this point. And a lot of them are very specific. So I encourage you, reach out to your provider. We'll also provide some contact information afterwards if you have follow-up questions. Because again, as we mentioned, we don't know everything about every person and every group out there. So there might be some unique considerations. Nonetheless, I really hope this conversation has proved to be helpful and you understand more about the COVID vaccines, what to expect. So with that, let's take a few questions from the audience. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller and Alex. We do have lots of great questions, so we are gonna do our best to get to them. But the common themes um, that I'm going to highlight, uh, this, the most reoccurring one is those that are on immunosuppressing drugs for various reasons, whether it's for having rheumatoid arthritis, uh, Sjogren's, uh, having HIV, various questions along those lines. If you could address that, please. And do you want to take that one? Yeah, of course. Um, thank you. That, and that's a good question. And um, uh, more as, as, mo as modern medicine gets uh, better and better, we have more and more immunocompromised people because we have more medicines for, for people with serious illnesses. Uh, and there is a lot of concern about what will happen. Is the vaccine safe? And is the vaccine effective? And do I need to change my uh, medicine schedule? And you know, there are hundreds of variations of those questions for each specific disease. For those of you in the audience who have uh, rheumatologic illnesses, uh, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and the like, um, the you know, HSS is actually re uh, well represented in the American College of Rheumatology guidelines on exactly this. And you'll be hearing more about that and your rheumatologist will soon uh, as we learn more about, uh, and, and, and guidelines are made for exactly uh, these issues. But in general, we think that people with immunocompromised are more likely to get really sick when you get COVID. So there's more to lose. You're, you're more at risk of having severe illness. And so far, there's no signal in the data that we have now of what we were worried about, or at least theoretically worried about that you would see uh, a flare of your lupus or a flare of your uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, when you get your uh, vaccine. So it looks like it's safe and it looks like these patients with immunocompromised might have an extra benefit because they're really at risk of getting sick. You know, and it's, it is a double-edged sword and I can understand the question. We, we did a nice feature series of why different people got their vaccines here at HSS. And I think one of the themes was, I, I wanted to be part of this. Um, because more data means more understanding, more understanding means better recommendations. And I think that's been an inspiration for a lot of people. Yeah, I, I think that it's, I, 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 that is true. And there's a, a quite a bit of, in rheumatology, because HSS is, a, is really a, a rheumatology center in addition to orthopedics, there's a lot of rheumatology research 
uh, going on in terms of vaccine safety and people's side effects and looking for whether there are any flares. So far, the answer is we don't know, but we don't think we see any signal at all. Wonderful, thank you. So next is more about being an HSS patient. Um, and uh, it's a two part question along the theme is how does it impact my care, whether it's surgery or coming in for a doctor's visit um, and how the vaccination rate of HSS employees makes patients feel more comfortable coming for care. So what is our vaccination rate for employees? So I actually don't know what our coverage rate is at this point, um, but we have offered the vaccine to everyone who is eligible um, through the New York state guidance for healthcare workers. Um, but we can certainly follow up um, after this call. In terms of policies, procedures coming in. So at this point, this is, this is the million dollar question. The reality is nothing changes. We have a long way to go between now and changing policies and procedures on safety protocols, travel restrictions, et cetera. Um, in terms of surgical patients, as of right now, we're asking that you get your vaccine at least seven days pre-op and have seven days post-op as well before you get your second dose. So you'd have to just plan a little bit for the 21 days for Pfizer or the 28 days for Moderna. And that can certainly be coordinated with your surgeon's office when you go to make your appointments. In terms of coming in, nothing changes in terms of travel screening, COVID screening, pre-op testing, none of that is different now. But thank you for getting your vaccine though, nonetheless, and for being an HSS patient. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, also in regards to the administration of the vaccine, is it reasonable to take Tylenol beforehand? Will it impact the antibodies that is given with the vaccine? I'll take that one. I, um, there is, there are some theoretical and poorly proven concerns about taking NSAIDs. That's Advil, that's Motrin, that's, uh, you know, uh, Ketorolac. Uh, so don't take those before your vaccine. And I have to say, I would not take Tylenol either before the vaccine. Um, there's no particular need to do it. The, the vaccine is fairly painless when it goes in your arm. I would advise you to get your vaccine, go home, and when you notice your arms starting to hurt, that's when you can uh, start taking your time. I think it's a good point because everyone has had a different experience. I think of my own team here in infection control and all of us had completely different experiences. Some people had nothing. So why take meds unnecessarily as well when we don't know how they interact? Wonderful. And do you recommend getting tested for COVID before getting your vaccine? Uh, that's, that's, a good, that's a good question. Uh, the answer is actually no. You should get tested if you have a reason to get tested. Um, and um, meaning, meaning you think you have a coronavirus infection. Uh, there was discussion uh, as the vaccine started to be rolled out at HSS, should we be checking everybody's serology, everybody's antibody, and only giving the vaccine to people who had a uh, positive, uh, a negative serology who had never had COVID before? And the answer is no. Uh, people who have had COVID before are still at risk of getting COVID again. We don't know exactly how much risk yet. We don't know how long you're immune for, but you can get it and there have been cases. So because we don't know how well natural immunity, immunity after you get COVID, the real COVID, how long that lasts and how good it is, we want those people to get vaccinated too. So I'll say it again, if you had COVID in the last 90 days, you can wait. But if you've had COVID before, yes, you should be vaccinated. And there's no reason for a blood test or a nasal swab or a saliva test or anything else. And I think just as a little plug to the point about why you should get tested, don't forget about things like exposure. So having prolonged direct contact with someone who ends up testing COVID positive and being around them, especially without a mask. Don't forget about travel. There's a lot of different rules in every different state. So we won't go there tonight. We could do a whole webinar on 50 states and 50 rules. But um, all said and done, if you have traveled internationally, there's changing rules there. And of course, if you have any signs and symptoms. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you've had a reaction to the first dose, 
We've learned about V-safe, but what happens to that second dose? So if it's an extreme reaction or severe reaction, is someone able to get the second dose? Yeah, so the recommendation is when it happens, report it both to your V-safe app. You can report it to your healthcare provider. You can also report it to the vaccination center where you got your vaccine. Um, and it kind of depends on the situation is the answer. They are not recommending getting the second vaccine if you have that severe anaphylactic reaction. But at this point, there are very few reasons to not get the vaccine. That, that's right. Um, we'll learn, we will surely learn more. Uh, but, but in general, if you're talking about anaphylaxis or a very severe uh, reaction that landed you in the hospital for some reason, it might be reasonable not to get a second vaccine. Uh, but for the majority of people, um, it's, it's fine to do. Thank you. And, and similar, Alex, you addressed this. There are several questions from those that have never gotten the flu vaccine, pneumonia, or shingles vaccines. And there's concern as to whether, how are they going to know if they have any allergies to the vaccine or, or how is their body going to react to because they've never been vaccinated before? We'll do a different webinar on all the other vaccines and why to get them, but I'll let Andy talk about the, the ingredients part. Yeah, no, I, I want to, I should, thank you for asking me to clarify that. Um, we're talking about, uh, let, let me, let me put it this way. People who have had severe, um, severe reactions to the COVID vaccine before or the components of the COVID vaccine before should not be getting this shot. That's what I, I should have, if I didn't say it clearly, I'll say it again. That's the one with the absolute contraindication. So if you know you're allergic to polyethylene glycol, you probably aren't, but, but if that's the case, then don't get this vaccine. If you haven't ever had a vaccine, I think you can go ahead and have your coronavirus uh, vaccine. I would go ahead and I think that your chance of being allergic to it is extraordinarily low in that one to 100,000 range. So I, I would say I wouldn't worry about it at all. But, but I'll add this, you know, from a comfort perspective, people shared a lot of things when I was running the vaccine center on my days. And if someone had a concern, we shared it with the great physician's assistants and docs and nurses who were there so we could monitor them more closely and just make sure that they knew that they were being watched post vaccination. So yes. you can share that at your vaccine center if you had a concern. Yeah, so it's a, you, you'll be, so most of the anaphylaxis reactions happen in the first 15 to 30 minutes and all of the vaccine centers are gonna have, and, and, you know, are, are, are supposed to have, and we certainly do have a place where you're watched uh, under medical observation for 15 to 30 minutes in a waiting room like area with social distancing. Um, and that's where you're gonna see these severe uh, reactions. If you haven't had your flu shot or your pneumonia shot or your shingles shot, um, you're welcome to come and talk to us about why they're worth it. But I wouldn't say that that increases your chance of being allergic, not one bit. And honestly, don't forget, we are still in the middle of, of cold and flu season as well. So if you haven't gotten your flu shot yet this season, you do need to space things out a little bit between getting COVID vaccine and flu vaccine, but it's still still good time to get that done too. So I think we probably have time for maybe one or two more questions, Max. Yes. So I'm going to get to two themes, if that's okay. One is um, on upcoming vaccines, not only the new J&J &J one, but pediatrics. What about those that are younger than 18 years old? What's on the horizon for those? Okay, well, I can take the J&J &J part. So it seems like it's going to be coming out soon. It still has to go through FDA approval, just like the COVID Pfizer and COVID Moderna vaccines did. Um, the New England Journal article that came out showed that it's about 90% efficacious, which is also really, really promising. And that if it's released as it's been studied would be one dose as opposed to two. Yeah, and, and that's right. And, and for the J&J, &J, I think uh, we're scheduled to have a big update on their phase three trial soon. So that's gonna be coming out and uh, hopefully that's gonna be a good option. Uh, pediatrics, um, I think that the answer is that studies are underway in school-aged children. Uh, I know that the Pfizer study for school, some school-aged children just filled up because I know some people who are trying to get into it. Um, and, uh, and, but we're several months away from really knowing uh, how well they work. And I'm not sure which of the vaccines our kids are gonna be getting or school-aged children will be getting before they go back to school. Um, praying that it happens sometime soon I certainly don't think we're gonna see any action on that uh, until late spring and it may be months after that too. Uh, so I can't, I, I wish I could give you 
uh, you know, some expert answer that you can't find in the news, but I don't have that. Mm, thank you. So before I share our last question, just a reminder to everyone that's listening, we will be summarizing the common questions that are coming across and posting them on our HSS website. So stay tuned for that link afterwards. Um, but the question that really struck me the most is for those that are vaccinated, when can they be around others that are uh, have also been vaccinated and give them hugs, be around them comfortable without masks? When is that day coming? It's not today, um, the short answer. And again, I'm, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. So I think we'll both take a stab at answering this question, but the reality is this. We haven't said at any point tonight that any of the vaccines are 100% effective. So that's first thing to consider. Second thing to consider is we also don't know the answer to the question about whether you can still spread COVID around once you've gotten your vaccine. It's very likely, as Andy said, that it would be highly reduced. But the last thing you'd want to do is be in a big group, potentially transmit something, spread it around to other people. We, that's what we've seen happen throughout the past year. The other thing at the end of the day to remember too is it's really, really hard to know what every single person has been up to in your social circles. So social distancing, that six feet, wearing a mask when you're around people who are from outside your household, all that's going to remain really important for a while. Yeah, it's heartbreaking um, that, that I don't think we can change our behavior yet. Um, and I've seen it um, you know, uh, discussed and summarized uh, from, from the top, uh, from the CDC and, and, and elsewhere, no recommendations to uh, take your mask off um, or to uh, change uh, social distancing guidelines. I think we're still in lockdown. And you'll remember that right now, there are really, uh, the, the vast majority of Americans have not been vaccinated. The idea, and, and uh, I've heard Dr. Fauci and other people talk about this, the idea of getting to a level where we have herd immunity predominantly through vaccine with something like 80% of the population vaccinated is sort of the goal here. And we're a long way from that. I am sure that as more people become vaccinated, we will see deviations in behavior. But until that point, you know, we're still prone to having outbreaks. We're still prone to uh, illness and propagation of this, uh, of this virus. And I think the safest thing to do is just uh, take it easy and not change behavior yet. But um, stay tuned. And, and I'm really hoping that we can push this and get to, um, to vaccine-induced durable, good quality herd immunity in this country soon. Thank you so much. So with that being said, thank you everyone so much for joining tonight's discussion and for your great questions. Again, we will provide a summary afterwards as well as some great resources from the CDC that provide more information, more data, et cetera. Um, before we close out, I do want to remind everyone of my top infection prevention tips. So don't forget, cover that nose and mouth with your mask. <laughs> Remove it by the ear loops, not by the front. That's not best practice. And it also can actually contaminate your face. Clean those hands, clean things like your cell phone often. And of course, stay well. That's all the time we have for tonight. After this, like I said, you'll get some additional resources. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you do have any questions, feel free to email pped at hss.edu or you can go online to hss.edu. And for more content on wellness, please visit our HSS YouTube channel where this recording will be posted about a week from now. Thank you very much and have a great night.